It is 8 September and today we're joining UNESCO in celebrating World Literacy Day. When I think about literacy, it really is the very sustenance of a society. It's how you build citizens. It's how people learn how to read their medication. And so without literacy, the quality of a society will always be compromised. Today in studio, straight from Cape Town, I really have the heads of organizations that are really leading the question of literacy in this country. And I think what makes this day so particularly special is that this, these are organizations that are le led by women. And I want them to introduce themselves to you as we start, to say what it is that they're doing so that we can actually get into the conversation and join this global conversation about what World Literacy Day is to us and what it is that we're doing in our different spaces to be able to drive literacy across the country. So I'm going to start with Smongile from the right. What I'd love for all you to do is just to say who you are and which organization that you represent. I'm Spongile Kumalo, the Executive Director of the Learning Trust. Um, we are grant makers in the education space. We are an intermediary organization that supports other organizations, smaller community-based organizations, especially that play in the field of after school. So we support them with funding as well as capacity support in organizational development. Um, I'm Sibwane Lonongola, I'm currently the CEO of Numeric, uh, we're a maths education focused organization. Um, we believe you can't have the conversation about numeracy without including literacy. Um, we train future teachers as well. They are the foundation of making sure that uh, young people excel in mathematics um, in the future. Um, hi, now I'm Somtate. I'll be coming to us for funding uh, Spongile. Uh, it's great to know that we've got a good mixed bags of, of people in the room. Um, CEO of Funda One Day, we focus on uh, particularly four pillars. The so one is materials development, the second one is training, teacher training, both pre and in service. The third one is that we um, experiment with scalable and sustainable models for government take up. And then the last one is research and advocacy. Hi, I'm Nabaga Zimatekina, I'm director at Nalibali. Uh, Nalibali is a national literacy development organization. We have a footprint across the country. We promote the culture of reading in younger children who are under the age of 10. And we believe that the adults who are in the living space of a child should be the ones encouraging and facilitating the love of reading in children. Hello, everyone. My name is Mamuso Makanya. I'm the executive director for WordWorks. Um, since 2005, WordWorks has been advocating, you know, focusing on early language and literacy development from zero to eight years old. Uh, we work in the three spheres, in homes, in schools, and in the community. And as WordWorks, we believe that, you know, par parents and caregivers are the children first um, teachers. Hi everyone, I'm Lungan Matolo, the Managing Director of the Bookery. And the Bookery creates uh, libraries in, in schools, primarily primary schools, because we believe that we need to provide access to literacy material for learners at a young age to improve their um, reading capabilities. But also, we believe that an, a library should not be a uh, white elephant, so we employ youths from the community to work as library assistants within these libraries, providing training for for them to be able to facilitate classes and literacy activities that promote the love of reading in children. So I think, I mean, one of the biggest, um, I think the, the real change in the literacy landscape that we all understand and we all know is the pandemic, right? So we are in a post-pandemic society that has been deeply affected. And I think each of the organizations have had to find a new way to pivot, to be able to respond to learning needs, one, but also to still meet some of your targets. And I'm very interested in how you've had to adapt, one, both your vision, right, the timelines of your own goals, and what it is that you are doing differently as a result of the pandemic in your particular organization. I'm going to start here, because I know that you all have a, a yeah, you already have the mic, but also you have a 2030 target for all children to be able to, yeah. to read, but also to count confidently by the age of 10 in 2030. So what does the pandemic mean for Funda Wande? 
Sure, and I think also, Sikhe, we don't see it as post-pandemic. I think we still are in the pandemic. And I was reminded about this like three weeks ago when I got COVID, like well, going to concerts, forgetting <laughs> that there's COVID. Next thing you know, I'm like, I'm sick with COVID. So I think it, it's still with us. Um, and although, yes, of course, circumstances or restrictions have become better. Yeah. Um, for Ufunda Wande, uh, our model basically focuses on supporting teachers in classroom, yes. right? So I know as representatives there's different spaces in which we intervene in and for us it meant school closure meant we do not have access into schools yeah. our program heavily relies on people supporting teachers in school supporting learners in schools um, and as a result um, in in 2020 we experimented because we also acknowledge that we're not ed tech uh, specialists, nor are we at home or community specialists, but we tried to um, provide teacher training through virtual platforms. We developed um, at home workbooks, um, you know, for learners to take home and complete easily instructions with their parents. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, uh, the biggest lesson for us is that. Funda Wanda, probably your playing ground is in the classroom. Uh, we had many challenges. Um, and I think this is where, in the spirit of collaboration for us, it was like, okay, cool. We should be working a lot more with other people um, that that's their expertise and that's their value proposition. So that's the one that we did try, mm -hmm. um, but it, it didn't land uh, at least as, su as successfully as we wanted to. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest findings that we've seen is that a, a light touch intervention or Funda Wanda intervention, which comprises of materials and a coaching, works in terms of impact, um, uh, has been the most successful in pre-COVID. And now with learning losses and all of that stuff, we have now have quite a high touch. It's from teacher guides, workbook resources, TAs, coaches, and, and so forth. And we saw in Limpopo that having that, like, like I said, high touch uh, for a post post-pandemic period um, has at least yielded to more uh, or better learning gains. So it's like balancing knowing where your strengths are lies as an organization, which is in the classroom and not outside. Mm -hmm. And that in this context, we've, have to, we've had to put in quite a lot mm -hmm. to be able to see or shift learning, learning gains, and particularly where we know that there's learning losses. Mm -hmm. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of what Unangamso has said is very similar to um, uh, what our findings as well. I mean, we are also a very um, classroom focused program. Um, we train teachers in the classroom. Um, we focusing on pre-service teachers, but we put them in the classroom. Our learning environment is very important for the impact that we make. Um, so during the pandemic, uh, it was very difficult for us to find a way to work uh, at long distance. However, um, one thing that really did work to our advantage was the fact that we already had relationships with parents because we, our model had already put us in a place where we consistently communicate with parents on a regular basis. So it was easy for us to touch base with parents, check in on what it is that they need, and also move our programs to a WhatsApp model. Um, I mean, it wasn't the most ideal because obviously at the end of the year when we look at results, it wasn't as impactful. But one thing we did notice is that we still were able to achieve twice as much impact um, Due, doing our program in comparison to those who didn't participate in our program. Um, and an, a very important part of what we do is also not just equipping future teachers and building foundations for learners, but also helping the parents uh, feel confident to uh, help their children with their education. We know that numeracy um, mathematics is a big scary um, topic and there's a negative attitude towards it. So when you speak about mathematics to parents already, they're already afraid of it. They already know they can't do it but when we give them tools to be able to use in their homes to be able to help their children um, succeed and they can tangibly see from the reports that we give them on a regular basis that was really helpful so we extended this during the pandemic by making small little mem memorandums um, sent them to on whatsapp to the parents so that they can be able to follow on with the learners uh, with their children's work as well um, so that was very helpful um, and I suppose in a post-pandemic world, um, we've had a lot of requests from our 
principals in the schools, actually the parents as well, uh, because there's a lot of learning gaps that have been created where they'd like us to start earlier. Um, we have experimented with a few schools, so our program focuses mainly on grade seven learners. Um, so just going a step earlier to try and intervene sooner right um, could be more useful and more impactful especially because there's these huge gaps that have already been created by the pandemic um, so these are just ideas that we continue to experiment with um, but also with teacher development I mean it has been amazing to see how the teachers adapted during the pandemic a couple of our teachers were able to be taken on in schools um, and in 2021 were able to run programs at a distance yeah. while timetables were rotating yeah. um, so this this has been um, a learning experience for Numeric as well to see what our programs also will look like in the future. Yeah. Yeah, I think things were very different for the Learning Trust. So we've got a foot in the philanthrop in philanthropy space. So we are a grant maker, but we also intervene in terms of working directly with communities that work with children. Um, so we don't work in schools, we don't work in the classroom, but we work directly with organizations strengthening their capacity to work with children. So and so mm -hmm. my particular question then to you is, did you have to reconsider how you're making your grants, right, the criteria for it, Absolutely. to be able to include a hybrid model or digital space, but also just thinking about like some of the effects of the pandemic and what, what that looks like as a grant-making institution for you? Absolutely. So the pandemic meant um, quite a lot of load on our shoulders because we take care of other organizations. So what we needed to shift is the way of thinking about how to gather money and attract money to the after-school space. Because when we cannot raise money, after-school partners cannot have money uh, because we are an intermediary in that space, right? So it was quite a bit burdensome on us, but at the same time, time, it was also about leading organizations, about seeing themselves um, kind of getting through the pandemic, right? So we needed to direct a lot of their thinking post pandemic. And in this space uh, where we kind of getting through um, COVID, we've now convened a space which is like a, a rallying call for organizations to say, how are we going to respond then to these learning losses that Dangamso speaks about, right? So how are we going to work together? So we've kind of created what we call the catch up coalition, which is a space for organizations to act jointly. So um, it's also essentially a space for not only nonprofits but also funders to think about how do we pool funding and supporting the after school space. Um, and so while we did make changes to our interventions during COVID, we're now thinking about how do we address those learning losses. I'm so interested. I'm like, if there is no school, what does after school mean? <laughs> Absolutely. In <laughs> fact, in fact, after school depends on there being school. Yeah, so we so obviously we operate beyond the classroom, yeah. but actually after school depends on there being school. Mm -hmm. So when schools were closed, after school programs could also not operate, right? Mm -hmm. um, we created a learning resource that was called the treasure box and we needed to spread it through communities and it felt like exchanging something illegal, right? Mm -hmm. So our after school partners, practitioners would, you know, go to gates of schools because this is really where learners could convene um, and exchange these uh, learning resources to take home with them. It also meant that our organizations needed to build relationships with parents because when those resources hit the, the hands of parents and caregivers, um, and I say caregivers including obviously, um, you know, sisters in the home, neighbors next door, um, so that they could actually use those resources uh, to teach children in the absence of teaching teaching and learning in schools. Um, I mean, I think the, there's a big question around like expanding the definition of literacy, right? So that it actually has more, um, it embraces a much larger question, right? So that's like the digital economy, right? Which is this hybrid model that we're coming together with. But really, I think some of the work that you have been doing through libraries, one, but one, two, through parents, right? But also I think with Nalibali through community engagement, but I also think that there's such a large and massive use of media. Um, and so I'm very interested, I'm going to start with you, Mamosa, to ask. <laughs> <Where's the> <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Part of what the pandemic has meant has that, that home has become a real center of learning. And so I'm interested in what it is that how you have, uh, as an organization, responded to 
further igniting the sense for parents to engage in their children's learning, one. But two, what differences you are finding across rural, across townships, across urban areas in terms of that parental response to children's learning? Sure. Um, Professor um, Janssen, in one of the graduation of actually a parent program of, of WordWorks, like we had said at the outset, that really parents, caregivers, go-go's, whoever is you know, better position to play that role. Are actually children's first teachers said, I mean, COVID has cut a whole lot of organization to the chase because we all had to see how to do the support and teaching and learning in the homes. And he's like, WordWorks has been doing this since time immemorial. So it's really important because that's what we believe. So when um, COVID hit, for us, it was like, wow, it, you know, you know, light at the end of the tunnel saying, here is let, let's not let um, maybe a good calamity go to waste. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and we actually use crisis <laughs> use crisis and see how to dial up the work that we've advocating and saying it's really important. So what we started doing is the work that we've been doing over the years, we just had to sort of package it to ensure that our parents and caregivers are supported to be able to do that at home. So our program sort of simplified and um, developed, not in an in-depth way as we used to do when working in schools. So we're able to sort of package it and say any caregiver or parent should be able to be empowered to use the materials and our story based programs in their own homes in community and elsewhere and we really saw a burgeoning of a whole lot of parents and saying you know can we be can you share with us in terms of the wordworks materials mm -hmm. so that we better place to be able to support our children in a non maybe threatening way simplified way because we are a rich story rich you know literacy rich uh, society mm -hmm. but how that fell off the cracks we we're not sure so we really it gave us an, an opportunity to reignite what is has been there but being given the tools and the know-how on how to support our children's literacy. I'm actually so interested. You know what, and I guess this question kind of runs to all of you, but I'm, I'm curious about what is it that makes a parent get material from you? Né? And they look at it and they think, hmm, I can teach my child that, right? Like, so what is it that you, you are thinking about in being able to make education engaging in the home in such a way that parents feel empowered to take up that, right? Like, and I think, and, I, and I'm, I'm guessing even in terms of mathematics as well, especially in the cultural context of maths in this country, right? Like as, as something that was not supposed to belong. If you think of those words of why would you teach um, uh, the black child mathematics or science, right? When all they're going to be are hewers of wood and carriers of water. So I'm interested in what is it, how are you thinking about how parents can feel empowered or how communities or how uh, volunteers feel like this is something that is within their right to carry and then to teach in the spaces that they're in. Uh, so I want to kind of just open that up to all of you. Um, yeah. I, I think it starts with breaking that barrier that reading and learning is for school environment. Mm -hmm. And also that to teach or encourage a child to read, you need to have some technical training. Yeah. So once parents understand that it is just as simple as any other life skill that they teach their children at home, mm -hmm. then they realize that it's just to encourage those children to, follow, to see reading as an enjoyable practice. Mm -hmm. Once they see it that way, then they open own it, they lead it. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who will be driving to say, which other book should I read? Where else can I get more resources? So once parents realize that it's not as technical as they think, mm -hmm. and it's not the, the, it's, it, the sole role of teachers mm -hmm. to encourage children to read, mm -hmm. it's a life skill. Once they see it as a life skill, then they see that it's their responsibility as the same as all the skills that they teach. The parents teach, uh, introduce children to language from the earliest ages. And when they do that, no one teaches them, no one trains them to do that. Automatically they do that because they understand that that is their role. They need to carry on with that up to foundation phase, up to the earliest grade, just to keep on encouraging children to have that as an everyday frequent practice mm -hmm. and, and, and adopt it as their own culture, then it becomes second nature. Mm -hmm. 
then they can see that reading and learning is not just solely for the school environment. And there's more time outside the school environment where children can engage and enjoy reading, not see it as an obligation, not see it as a school task related activity, but see it as something, a world that they can explore yeah. and learn more about themselves and uh, even how society works. So parents, once they understand the benefits mm -hmm. of a child engaging more, with reading and how they improve their, their reading skills, how they, how they understand the world, how they develop and, and solidify their emotional intelligence, okay. then they realize that there's more that the child can learn, more than what I can give and teach my child. So it's just breaking those perceptions to say reading is only for the school environment. I, as a parent, I have enough. I don't have to be literate. I don't have. I can tell my own stories of my upbringing. That alone can build the vocabulary of the child and and introduce them to storytelling. To say, actually, there's more I can get from the books from just using uh, the phone and going to Facebook and all these other things that our children engage with. So it is breaking those barriers to say it is, it's a technical skill for me to drive. I have, I have a question for you. Do you remember? the first sense of storytelling in your own home. So who was that for you? Uh, unfortunately, it was my father, and he was very strict. So it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was not an enjoyable exercise, because you're just waiting for it to end. Mm -hmm. But the only thing that made me comfortable to even listen and, and stay longer is to see the expression in his face, that this is a journey that he enjoyed and he wants to try to impact it on us to say this is how the world works in their generation, and he wants us to take those values and embed them in our lives. So I, I, was, I was enjoying his expression and how he was telling it, not the actual story, because I was like, goodness, to be in the same, same room with this guy, it was just like intimidating. But I think that is also another challenge in the, in the, in the households and in the, the different cultures that we have. Other parents, they don't see themselves engaging more with their children, because that's not how they were brought up, then they don't see the need and the importance of that. But if we break that and show them the benefits, because behavior is motivated by rewards. So once they see the rewards and the benefits of engaging in that behavior, mm -hmm. then they will do it more, and no one has to drive and push them. So I think for me, um, and I was speaking to my team uh, last week, um, there's this uh, quote that says, if you want to hide anything from a black person, hide it in a book. And for me, that bothers me because then it speaks to access. And when we're having such conversations, we need to start deconstructing what reading and learning means because of the response that Mamuso, uh, sorry, um, Mabakazi just gave you is that it speaks to how our parents taught us to read. What has been always available to the black child was either a newspaper, a textbook, you know? So, a Bible, <laughs> a, a, a Bible. So now when we are sitting in these circles, those things are things that we need to highlight so that parents are given the confidence. The confidence to say that I can teach my child because once now we, 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 we take your Harry Potters and, and your textbooks and then we um, test kids' learning or ability to read, then the parents then feel that they don't have the skill but once we then look at what is available for them, then we also build their confidence because for us as, as, as an organization, we see access as a problem. Our thing is access to literacy and providing learners with books and um, th then we are able to give them that access. So I think for me, that's one of the things that we need um, to work and uh, get across is that if the basics that you have, storytelling, you know, then you are able to teach your child. What I'm interested in is what have we forgotten about the place of libraries in our society? We have forgotten the value of the, what the library uh, or the, the value of the library, especially school libraries. 
Um, I think with the change in different um, curriculums that have been put in place, removed the library. A library is not just a place where there's just books. It's a place where you can communicate, you can express yourself. There's enjoyment uh, in the library. And the biggest role model that you'll find in a library and that will help learners uh, want to pick up a book is, a li is the librarian, it's what we call library assistants. And we believe that because a library is, 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 has access to reading material, it is a heart of the school because you are able to um, prov uh, get access to books, which um, kids are then um, reading, but also with, uh, to touch on, um, Bonello, um, the games that are played in the library. You know, snake and snakes and ladders, you do maths, you're calculating. It's not just about books, but it's a, a resource that helps what is happening in the classroom, in the library, but in a fun uh, uh, environment, in a fun space. You know, the important question of how do we really support parents and sort of demystify um, that, you know, literacy is only done in classrooms yeah. and by people who are trained as teachers in, in doing so. I mean, one of our programs, um, which is really, we have worked with a whole lot of other partners yes you know, actually um, building African stories. I mean, in our time program, as an example, you know, it's like maybe simple stories, day-to-day -day guidance yeah. for any parent to be able to follow those stories on a regular basis. And you able to use your own life experiences in imparting those stories. Some of the feedback that we've received from male caregivers, which uh, maybe traditionally haven't been involved in, in the literacy of their own children. Like one of them saying, you know what, I'm so empowered now to be able to read with my daughter and we, we bonding and then we able to, even when we go shopping, we use, you know, maybe their shop as a learning space when we're doing grocery shopping, you know, when we're playing games outside. So you really demystify and really maybe extend the learning experience beyond traditional once. Yeah. Related to the libraries, I think mostly children are encouraged to engage I with the books in the libraries if they are mostly in home language. Mm -hmm. And that has been the challenge. And as we've been speaking to different library institutions to say, uh, how can we promote e circulation of the books and get more children to take books home? And the challenge has been that the language. So uh, it, we need to have more books in the home language of the children to be circulated. And also uh, for parents to encourage children to take books home, I, I think mostly parents have that fear that if a child touches a book, uses a book, it will damage the book. So they came out about the maintenance of the book more than the content and what the children, children can benefit from the book. So the, the, that, that partnership between uh, a school library a public library, a classroom library, for the more children take books home, the more they use them, more than that limited period where they are under pressure to just read a, a simple text. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know what? I think something that I'm very interested in, for particularly the organization, I'm thinking of you, uh, Nangamso, particularly for the organizations that are doing work around measurement. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking about when you say if we have more books in uh, actual home language. Part of what I've found really interesting as a children's writer myself is the translation of the work sometimes is so different, right, from home language. Yeah. So sometimes when I read the I'm like, I'm like, right? Like, <laughs> oh, when I, and so I'm interested in, in terms of how you, as an organization, as Nali Bali, that does incredible amounts of translation of work, one, how it is you're thinking about the translations being relevant, yeah. right, in terms of how they feel as a story, yeah. but also for an organization like you, um, Nangamso, how then you're thinking about measurement questions mm -hmm. given the fact that there's such difficulties with translation, right? So so I'm thinking about if I'm seeing a word for the first time and I'm being measured in terms of how well can I read, right? That the likelihood is that I'm going to fail that measurement. So what is how how are you thinking about translation and measurement in relation to the actual stories, mm. feeling like stories that kids want to be measured with, right? Like where they can be like, yeah, 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 yeah you know, like versus <laughs> and then we're still testing that. So how, yeah. how are we thinking about those measurement um, inefficiencies? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll take the mic now. <laughs> I'll take the stick. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
I mean, good question, and at least uh, it's one that, uh, through my master's uh, uh, dissertation, I in particularly looked at mm. this idea of uh, translation, in particularly around multilingual um, assessments and cross-country assessment, which there could be some validity issues in a sense. Um, and and I think the biggest finding from that sort of looking at a Pearl's passage that was developed somewhere in. America and in Germany, wherever the EIA is sitting, you know, uh, how are we putting our kids in a in a back foot already, yeah. you know? Um, and I I'll admit, I'm probably the first person who will always admit when you are wrong is to say that within the polls, um, at least doing the different analysis, is that it wasn't the translation that was the issue. Oh, yeah. It was more like vocabulary building and, and how do we make sure, how do we, how do we use our diversity? And I was looking particularly at dialects, not necessarily like mm -hmm. high frequency words, low frequency words, but mm -hmm. how do we use the fact that there's multiple dialects to leverage off reading for meaning? And I think yeah. that's where we're missing to say, if it is Bagba, it surely is Bagba, some shouldn't work to my disadvantage if I want to learn the standard is it Kosa. How are we using my Sibagba language in teaching the standard is it Kosa? So that's the one, um, which I'd find very interesting because my hypothesis was like, we shouldn't take part in these assessments. They put our kids in uh, uh, disadvantage, yeah. you know, and then we come back every four years and we say, 78% kids can't read for meaning, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, but I think for me, it's it 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 one. It wasn't the translation, and two, it just it just um, embedded the fact that how are we leveraging on our natural resources, mm. multilingualism, dialects, and how are we incorporating that into the classroom setting. Yeah. And then um, on the book story, I think um, you know I always say like, how do you play soccer without a soccer ball? It's like the same thing with reading. How do you learn how to read if there's no access to, to, to materials? And I think, although as an organization, I mean, we, we say we develop materials, but really materials that are like classroom based. But I think, again, hampering on Ngabagazi and Mamuso's uh, case here is to say, you know, we want learning to happen beyond just the classroom context. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that um, we need to as a sector, you know, uh, because a, a lot of these translation debates, and I get the point, I'm like, it makes complete sense. Um, but how are we moving past these debates that hold us backwards? Because year in, year out, there's a cohort of kids that exit the foundation phase, and at least from the assessment perspective, you know, um, they're not at least where we think they should be, which inevitably has uh, subsequent consequences for their further academic tra trajectory. Mm -hmm. For me, something like this is to like, guys, let's come together. Mm -hmm. There is a serious crisis in this country. How are we coordinating our efforts amongst each other? Yeah. Does it still make sense for Fulawande to develop stories, but we've got Nalibali and WordWorks that have a series of, of, of resources to themselves? So it's like, it's, Yes, it's an issue, but I think there's also an, an opportunity yeah. here. And we can leverage from each other's strength, whatever that is, uh, in, in moving forward. Yeah. So I do, I, I, I believe in measurement. Yeah. Um, I do believe that it's important. Um, and as much as the reading for enjoyment, but I think at the end of the day, I think we can all agree, we want kids that can be able to function in the society. Yeah. And, what, and what, what does that require? So for me, it's like we shouldn't set our learners up for failure. Yeah. We rather want to set them up for success. Yeah. So I know the measurement is, is quite a, a, we've got a love-hate, South Africans in general have a love-hate relationship with counting, when, with, <laughs> with counting <laughs> and assessments and all of that. Yes. But I do think that it provides us with valuable insights. Yeah. Um, and, and, and at least from a classroom co context where we sit in, is to say to teachers, this is not a finger-pointing exercise. Yeah. We're trying to sort of understand where kids are and the type of support that they need, yeah. rather to say, we're now Miss Bambani, you didn't do, or whatever the case is. So, and I think the more we do that collectively, I don't know what matrix or formula that would look like, but I think the more we can inform, uh, in particularly from materials, a development, translation perspective, um, how we move forward, but I do. I, I believe that you know we cannot we cannot solve these issues without the resources that we need, and and I think. Oh, and one also other thing I wanted to mention is that like um, I did a a, a research 
and are still to be completed like many like many like many projects but basically i was trying to i was doing a linguistic analysis between english foundation phase uh, books free books because we know that at least in our context we strictly work in no fee so like let's say but you want to access books what does that look like uh, so for english books titles and as well as for is it titles and it was so shocking for me i mean not not by surprise but like it's less than a quarter of books that are available for this course when you in in relation to english yeah. so i mean already it's like these numbers are are quite alarming and i know that there's a lot of we made a lot of progress yeah. in developing and i think to just encourage writers storytellers you know um to keep to keep writing uh and i know probably uh, uh, publishers will kill me by saying this, but also free access because we know that a lot of the societies that we work in do not have a book budget mm -hmm. in the 1,600 that they have to, you know, whatever the case is. So it's like thinking of these um, creative ways how we can do access, how we can do the quality, and then to some level, like system wide, to say we are on track mm -hmm. or not. You know, just to add on the um, impact and measurement, um, we are fortunate in that we don't have to use a lot of language yes. um, in our testing, um, but we have been mindful about it. You know, like uh, our measurements, uh, we have been deliberate about trying to use language that is simple and accessible for the learners. Um, it's interesting in our classroom space as well, because obviously we test learners um, throughout the year, not just for the external evaluations. Um, we have um, word sums, word problems that we use in class, and learners will struggle even if it's addition, you know, um, subtraction, they will struggle with word problems. We have to discuss them and interpret them in a course. Um, where it gets tricky is when we're in Johannesburg, where we have a classroom that has Kosa speaking, Zulu speaking, Susuta speaking, all in one classroom. Um, but yeah, we have to make those considerations. We have to make those adaptations. Um, and also one thing that is very interesting in some of what we do in our classroom is um, when we introduce topics, uh, just an example, division, right? Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorite topics to introduce. Um, we, will, we draw from the children's knowledge what they understand in their mother tongue, right? Like, was knowing a division, mm -hmm. how do you apply it? When you're playing, when do you apply division, you know? Like, there's this game we used to play when we were young. I don't know if a lot of kids still play it now. Oh, wait. Yes. And before you play, I'm sure I'll eat the risk waiter. Oh, Lala, wait, or any other childhood game, you have to divide the teams, right? Like, we are Pika, you're on my side, you're on my side. That's an example of sharing, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, during that process of Upika, that's division, right? And use what they know, the language that they can access to teach maths. Critical thinking is developed through literacy, from what they know. And that's how they end up getting to a place where they can engage well with mathematics as well. Um, so these are important conversations to have, even with parents. I mean, you asked the question about parents. One thing I've come to learn um, working at Numeric for the past six years is that parents love their children and they want what they didn't have for their children, right? Um, and we do our best to provide a quality service to our parents. Um, and one of the things that we do is we give them reports every quarter. Now, we have a whole session where we invite parents to analyze a child's report. We tell them what this means, right? So now, when they see their child improve, when they look at the marks, we tell them deliberately how you can make that mark improve by using this tool that your child has in the home, right? So properly making the relationships to empower the parents to impact that report. So if they saw that a child was on a certain mathematics mark in term two, they do something, they see it improve in term three. The parents feel that it's tangibly within their own power to influence their children's learning. Um, so yeah, I th these are tangible ways to assist parents as well. Um, so, <laughs> so you know what I, what I would love for people to get a sense of, with some of the organizations that you're doing work with, what are some of the good stories, right, as a grant-making mm -hmm. institution that you look at and be like, 
man, this is important for my right? mm. like, If you could just kind of like lift some of those so that our audience can have a sense of uh, what is happening in the after school space, mm. uh, but what are some of the stories that show the heart of the work? Hmm. <laughs> it's funny because Mamuso looks at me and says word works and that's exactly That's why she could ask you And it's precisely one of the really great examples. I think a good example of after school really working is the collaborations that we've seen. So we've supported organizations from when they were maybe even two years in existence. Um, so examples of WordWorks, like Ikamva Youth, are such organizations that we supported from scratch, from the start. And these are organizations that are now 18, 20 years old that have done amazing things. But what's really incredible is when they've come back to collaborate with us in spreading their working models. So in the case of WordWorks, um, we started what we call the Community Collaboration pro Project with WordWorks and Ikamva Youth, ac actually. Um, and our role in the partnership was actually bringing the funding, but the role of WordWorks was providing the materials, providing the training, and spreading their model. Um, and it particularly trained parents uh, to do paired reading with children with one of WordWorks' models, the re Ready steady read ride model, which really proved, um, firstly, that learning or teaching didn't have to be done by teachers, um, but also that we could empower the parents to do something for their own children, but for other children in communities. So what we did is we gave grants to smaller community-based organizations that underwent the training with WordWorks, and those parents of children in those schools and in those communities were able to do paired reading with children in the classroom while the teachers teaching the rest of the kids. So these are incredible stories of how we've been able to collaborate with other organizations um, and obviously also being able to strengthen the smaller organizations and taking up something like that, um, like a good practice working model that actually works. So you do co-parenting very well. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> very well. <laughs> That's a good one. You know, before I actually get into more specific questions, I'm thinking about our particular context as a country. And something that I've thought about quite a bit is uh, the place of culture in learning. And in particular, when I think of our kids, <laughs> right, as a country and where we come from, is that dance and music has always been such a central um, engagement right that that doesn't is that's part of who we are and that's part of what we're exporting to the world if you kind of think about south african music and south african dance all across the world and i'm interested in if any if you've had any kind of thoughts right about how we utilize what we have as part of enriching a learner-centric approach to learning and literacy in the country I'll start quickly. I mean, I was just relatively short. So, um, and I think you're right, Sikha. I think there's one thing about us as, um, in particularly black Africans, like we sing and dance when we're happy, when we're mad, when we, <laughs> when we're grieving. Like it's it's so it's a song. Everything, uh, you know, sort of like relates to a song, which is I think it's it's what makes us quite unique as Africans. Um, and at Funda One, I mean, this we. Um, our initial model in 2019 that we implemented kind of was really like structured, um, you know, like this is how you teach phonics, ABC, whatever the case is, and did kind of like miss that nuance of culture and social aspect. So subsequently now to that in our version two of our materials, we've kind of drawn song and dance to how we teach phonics, uh, how we uh, read stories, shared reading and you know, and so forth. Also in maths, they play a lot of games, they sing a lot of songs. Um, so now we have, yeah, we've kind of seen initially that there was a gap in an area and we've tried to incorporate this idea of enjoyment to learn you know as an enjoyment through using song and dance yeah. yeah yeah I agree we also have incorporated especially um, singing songs to um, 
keep maths concepts as well. We have what we call energizers in class. Kids come with their own games that they play outside. They adapt them to put in some mathematics concepts into that energizer. Um, one thing that is really interesting though when we do these activities in class is that, you know, when we're young, um, English obviously is not the first language. Mm. So there's these songs that were meant to be English but have transfer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, you don't even know what it means, but let's just put some mathematics in there and the kids still know the rhythm and they learn. So we absolutely draw from their experiences and the songs that they sing as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think also drawing from our own experiences, you know, I grew up in Buputatswana, right, in a homeland, um, and all of us pretty much Botswana. And central to, I, I know, but I... <laughs> I grew up Setswana, funny enough. <laughs> Thanks, Nangamsa, for exposing me. <laughs> but I mean, our national anthem was in Setswana. Um, we had cultural spaces like the Mabana Center in uh, Mafiking where we did Setswana traditional dance. And so like three times a year, we would travel on a bus to, you know, Mafiking to go dance in, you know, Setswana dance uh, all together. So I think art and culture were very central to how we grew up, right? So not only drawing from these kids' experiences, but also from, from our own um, as teachers, as also caregivers in the home and outside of the home, teaching, learning from our own experiences, I think is, is Critical. It's interesting. One of the programs that we're working with the, you know, the GDE Gauteng Department of Education, working with um, official subject advisors. I mean integrating great R into their work. You know how these teachers break into a song, it doesn't matter what word works as facilitators or as trainers is doing. You see them breaking into song and improvising and I mean some of us, it's, it's like I'm not African, I don't know, I miss when God was dishing out um, <laughs> skills for people to dance. I didn't quite get uh, my quote. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, they break into song and improvise and see how to really appropriate it. And it's beautiful to behold how we can improvise. Yeah. Yeah, I think singing is central to the work that we do because enjoyment, exactly, oh, yeah. reading, yeah. we are creating positive reading spaces and experiences, and that involves singing. But if you want to develop language in a child, uh, you need to do it in more repetition. And with singing, you repeat more words, and words go to the long-term memory. Mm -hmm. That way, ch children can remember things. So it, it's it's not just for enjoyment, but it it, it serves different purposes. Yeah. And even uh, even the adults who are in the space of the child, they use singing to bring uh, the child's attention because it's difficult to 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 secure that or to grab that because children are are so impulsive they are moving all the time and also singing introduces movement and according to research uh, physical development and literacy development they are mostly inter interdependent and interlinked mm -hmm. so when you do your storytelling whether it's reading time or it's story stories oral language when you introduce singing and children start to act out the characters and the scenes in the story then they those are those uh, what are these uh, positive reading experiences mm -hmm. that encourages children and build that appetite for children to even do more stories. Mm -hmm. So with the singing, it serves so many purposes. I, I want to actually pin that, this question back to you because what we know about libraries is silence, <laughs> right? <laughs> Shh, in the library. <laughs> Right, like, and, and so I'm. I'm interested. What one, and I guess maybe like the the fundamental of libraries being the space of silence, mm -hmm. but two, how do we then begin to connect libraries to communities, yeah. right? Because that's the base point of where books are housed, and that's yeah. what people are looking for access to. Mm -hmm. So, w what do we do with libraries? What is the future of libraries in ways that connect communities so that they feel like it's a space that they belong in? 
I think uh, with us creating, let's firstly, school libraries, we always um, work with the school management to find out the culture of the school. And um, in creating the spaces, we always say, what do you want? What's the need of the school? What's the culture of the school? And then secondly, we also bring in new roles. We make it a fun space for kids to gravitate to, because now if it's a space that's not inviting, that's not colorful, that doesn't speak to the child, then it's not going to be a space that they run to. But also another fundamental thing for us is the people that work in our libraries. Because if I remember from childhood, it was always um, the library assistant who encourages us. So finding those people that are first passionate about kids but also about reading so that they're able to um, be role models for the learners to just go to, to speak to and to just advise on the type of books that they are reading. So working with the infrastructure and sourcing the right material for learners but also I think over time and with more information about how kids learn and how kids read. We now implementing um, play learning. You know, kids also learn through play. And that needs to be a focus because now you can't be telling uh, great art learners to keep quiet all the time because then they're not going to be uh, cultivating that, that love and the enjoyment because now it's about being strict. So the more you uh, bring in the... Um, the games, the more you bring in singing, the more they gravitate towards the book. Because I think um, in South Africa, because we were not um, taught or uh, the love of reading and the love of books has not been something that was pushed through within our communities. We need to encourage that. So it's a, if it's a fun space for the learners, then they will always um, want to be there. They want to take the book. They, w they want to see what's inside and then you then encourage from there. So uh, to answer your second question, I think um, a partnership, partnerships between schools and public libraries, between organizations like ourselves to promote the life of reading, to, 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 to get the word out, to advocate that, you know, a library is not a, li a space where it's quiet. I understand maybe within universities, you know, that has to be what um, the, the culture of that. But if we are not teaching our kids how to access big books, how are they going to be able to survive university? Because in university, it's strict, it's pedantic, it's about, okay, this is where you find this books, you need to know um, the decimal uh, system to be able to know which material you're sourcing. But within a library, if you're making, uh, or a school library, if you're making that fun, they get to know, okay, Dewey Decimal, this is how you find um, nonfiction, this is how you find fiction, so that when they get to university, they're able to source it, they have that uh, fundamental understanding of a library. Mm. So, I mean, one of the really great projects that I got to work with Nali Bali on was World Read Aloud Day. Um, and in 2020, when I was uh, the ambassador for World Read Aloud Day, we were able to reach 3 million children in one day uh, yes. in terms of the story downloads. And I think what Nali Bali has been able to do incredibly well mm. is media reach. Um, but I think what I found so incredible was realizing how many people are connected throughout provinces, right? Mm. Like, so the grandmothers that were calling in to say, I'm always waiting for the story time. Yes. Um, and, and I think that's something that's so powerful that you actually have like a lever over. Yeah. And so I'm interested, one, in how, um, in how the organization thinks about intergenerational storytelling, yes. right? Yes. Uh, because I think that's such a powerful part of what our communities and cultures are made of, yeah. that so many people who don't necessarily have their mothers in the house, but they have their grandmothers in the yeah. house. And so how do we, one, intergenerational storytelling, one, but also how we expand our understanding of literacy, the definition of literacy, in those communities where it's happening, yeah. uh, even with people that can't necessarily read or write. Yes. I think that that is key. Uh, to recognize people, even those that cannot read or write. Uh, and also, I think even from the African culture, we believe that the more people are older, especially our our grannies, mm -hmm. they, there's a lot of wisdom there that needs to be transferred to the younger ones. So from there, even the storytelling, the culture of telling stories to the young ones, it's, it's been there for years and it's been uh, evolving over the time, but it's, it's been embedded in each and every family. And we know that the family unit has changed the format. It's no longer two parents and a child. It takes all different forms. And knowing that there's been, with HIV pandemic, we've had 
more than 4 million children who do not even have parents who are staying in child and, child and, youth, uh, child and youth care centers. And those are taken care by caregivers and other children are taken care by relatives. It means then the family unit has changed, even our approaches have to change. So that's why we emphasize adults who are in the space of a child. It means we're not just saying parents, because if you're not a parent, then you don't see it as a, a prime role for you to do anything for the child. So any any adult who's in the space of a child, uh, especially the intergenerational one, it means that there is a lot that children do not understand about your generation and what you went through because they were not there. So there's so many stories that they can share with children, which are fascinating, because you are presenting to them a world that they've never seen, which they don't even believe believe it exists because you you tell them about uh, going to town using horses which is something that they've never seen and fetching water from the river which is something they've never seen because they always get water from the tap so it's, it's a new world to them to say wow this is how the world has evolved and people even survived then and at the time people even survived a lot of illnesses because they were moving a lot there was a lot of physical and move, uh, physical development and movement so people were much healthier then than today where children are just glued to the screen and don't want to move and so there's so much learning from people who are coming from different generations from, to each other and they need to create more species spaces for them to share yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to open the question to us all. Um, I think one of the big things that we're saying about transforming literacy learning spaces and strengthening them, right, is being able to have more hybrid models, but also really developing the materials and the physical spaces in which people are learning in. Um, I think something that is really interesting is the more digitalized we become, there's also, I think, like the consistent um, question around distractedness. Um, and I'm really interested to think about or to ask the question of how do we build build stronger, more transformed learning spaces that are digitalized in the midst of like a, almost like a high attention disorder in the world, right? Um, where people have to almost like form their own identities, they're growing in the space, but at the same time that there's so much that's competing for their attention in this new learning space. So almost to say, what are the new potential challenges that are coming with a hybrid model of learning? Yeah. And what are the ways in which we can almost like think forward to ensure that they're strong for the building of a sustainable society of young people who can actually focus. Okay, seeing that I've got the mic, <laughs> I'll give it a stab. Um, so I'm of the viewpoint, uh, and probably uh, our president and all these people that are pushing robotics, um, I'm like, the basics is to be able to read. <laughs> I'm not convinced as a broader, at least where it, it, where it largely impacts, uh, which is your, your disadvantage areas, um, that um, you know, for the sustainability of digital literacy, it's there. I don't think we have the enough infrastructures and or whatever the case is. And it almost feels like we need to start there first before pushing things or announcing like we're doing blended learning, uh, but there's no connection if you go to Imgandula, for instance. So for me, I'm like, I'm of the opinion that we need to get our basics right first before claiming all of these uh, international and you know, sort of jumping on board with, yeah, uh, yes, yes, you know what I mean. So that's so that's where I am, yeah. and um, I do think that I am of the opinion that, um, particularly in the early early grade or early reading developmental stages, like there's something so precious about closing a book. I don't know about you guys, like I feel such a like when I've read a book and then I close it, I'm like I'm done. Like there's this interest like thing that happens, even when turning the page, you know. Yeah. And I do feel that we, and yes, we are moving towards the fourth industrial revolution, the whole thing, but it almost feels like uh, we need to strike a balance, for me at least, and I think that there are things that we can learn from actual like physicalness. Yeah. And I think um, moving, so sort of your last question, um, trajectory-wise now to say, um, kids are doing a lot of things, there's so many expectations, they must do robotics, they must do this and whatever. I always believe that like prioritization, simpli simplifying things um, and like focused target intervention. For me, I think, um, I think we require our curriculum our system requires so much for learners. I mean, I look at my niece's homework stuff, I'm like, how are you doing this in grade 
two, grade three, you know, but obviously she's, it's a different context. But also to say, well, um, we need to prioritize. Like it almost, even if you look at like government policies and all of those, a list of about 50 things that kids must do. I, in the ideal world, it would be great. I think if we have ticked a lot of these foundational things, um, then we can probably do all of that. So a scaffolded approach for me, I think we'd need to consider. There's many things that we can do as a country, but we probably need to prioritize. And I think in a much more younger age is to really balance this like blendedness versus online, but yet again with a caveat to say we need to, we need to have the infrastructure in place. Um, I mean, we saw it guys in COVID, how our kids, they just fell extremely behind by a mere fact of like a barrier of digital access. Yeah. Um, and here schools about on abortion, whatever, continuing, business as usual, you know? So it almost feels like, I'm not saying we shouldn't get there, but it's like, it's a goal and we need to ensure that the steps that takes us there yeah. are first completed. But it's not gonna help announcing, because what we're doing is just widening this bi-model education system that we're in. The rich get richer and, <laughs> and the poor get poorer. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so that's 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 sort of my view, is to say we need to go back to basics. And there's a lot that as a system we would have to consider. Yeah. Um, but I, I think what I want to add to the question to that is the equality and inclusivity of this new hybrid model, right? So one, the sustainability of it, given the challenges, but two, then the inclusivity and equality of it. Um, and I'm interested to hear if there's any kind of work that you're doing with uh, private partners around increasing access, one, uh, around the cost of internet, but also around like its availability, especially in rural um, communities, yeah. especially when data costs us, it is so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So, before, before, I've got one, one, one sentence, guys. Sorry. Yeah. No. <laughs> one sentence. I'm not trying to take advantage of being host, but uh, I'm going to pull that. I'm going to pull that. One thing, right? I think we can all agree. Yeah. The amount of private money that is being spent on education, take all of it, both philanthropy and CSI money. It is nothing close to what government spends. It's almost 1.8% of what government spends. My viewpoint is you won't transform the society using private money. Yeah. I, think, I think we probably should be getting more and more on the same page as government should be held accountable one. They should actually do their job and do it relatively well because they're the ones that are sitting with the largest budget and influence and power and all the things that come with being in government um, to be able to, to, to make so, so. So just on your last point, yeah. to say, Guti, I think we can leverage of private money, but I think for us at least, and for me as Ufunda, Ufunda Wande Nangam says to say, where you need to be shifting things is at a policy level. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's so much that you said there, Nangam, so that has me moving in my seat. Um, so I think, first of all, just to start with the public-private partnerships, I think it's, I mean, they're well known in kind of infrastructure development, right, in building the country that obviously private money has to be involved. And I take your point about government's responsibility, but I think it's a societal responsibility to make sure that kids are learning, to make sure that we develop our country, right? Um, so I think it's, it's really important that we see both. Where I think that you are right is probably private money has to be seen as more catalytic, yeah. um, as being used to test, because I think where public-private partnerships are really important is in promoting innovation and creativity, and perhaps because of the financial constraints, budget constraints in government is that we don't have money to play with, we don't have money to test, and that's where CSI money, philanthropic money needs to be used, right? So it's not that significant, but I think if you're talking 10 billion by CSI, that's significant enough that it can test, that it can help us be creative, innovative, so that government can take it up for systemic intervention, right? Yeah. So I think both are, are valid. Um, yeah, I mean, I 100% agree with... Uh, Every time we take the mic, I'm like, how are we going to let you count? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 100%. Well, that would be like, ah. <laughs> 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 really 
put when is World Numeracy Day that like we can actually like, yeah. think about it. Like, yeah, no, it. definitely. Um, I 100% agree with what Unangamso was saying. Um, and just to give a brief history about numeric, um, we started being on a digital platform, right? We were doing Khan Academy classes in townships, right? Mm. So most of us here are focused solely on low income areas. And we know that infrastructure um, to be able to deliver good quality, um, high impact programs using um, technology is very difficult, right? Um, so we started using Khan Academy, using school computer labs. There was connection problems, the computer labs were getting stolen. There was always a problem. Kids obviously focus was one of the challenges as well. And we slowly moved away from that. And that's where we were able to get higher impact. Um, and during COVID, that is when, um, Obviously, we had to be creative again because we know what we've learned before, right? And accessing the parents directly was what assisted in us getting some impact um, with uh, um, during the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, moving forward, I 100% agree with what Nangamso said. They had, there's a lot of infrastructure um, challenges that we have that we need to address first before we get into the conversation of um, actually uh, making sure that we have higher impact with learners while doing uh, distance. But at the same time, as an organization that also trains future teachers, whether you give a teacher a chalk, a screen, a pen, if they're an excellent teacher, they're an excellent teacher. That's it, right? A screen is a tool, right? You still need to train the teacher. Um, one of the tools that we use, we focus uh, on training teachers through Khan Academy, where they develop their own foundations and they watch the videos on how to introduce these concepts. And they still have to plan and make them more relatable. Like what I was talking about division, I go and watch Khan Academy, I think about examples that will relate to my children in class and go teach. Um, yeah, thanks. Hi. Beteta Osis. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, we cooking, we cooking. Um, just uh, some thoughts on the lessons WordWorks learned in terms of this online work in rural areas in the Eastern Cape. I mean, obviously during COVID, we couldn't do that face-to-face -face in-person training. So we piloted through one of our funders an online ECD practitioner literacy training. And, and we didn't know how this thing is gonna pan out. It's still very early stages, but you know what? It's sobering when you go to, um, so we, the uptake wasn't quite where we hoped it would be, you know, when we checked in and then we sent our team to the Eastern Cape rural and, and township areas. And it was so sobering when you speak into some of the ECD because they were there in person now and having like a little trying to understand from a, a, a neighboring uh, ECD centers, what are some of the challenges in accessing the online uh, training themselves? I mean, some of them couldn't even download on the phone. You know how assumptions could be made mm -hmm. somewhere in the Western Cape headquarters of this organization that maybe this is how it will it will pan out. So when our team were there, we're actually helping the teachers, the practitioners to download on the phone, just this, um, you know, this um, training, so they're like, oh, yeah. oh, you know, you can't just, you know, assume. Yeah. And we identified some of the, um, those that were better able to do that, to sort of share, you know, that peer learning among themselves. And really the big issue of connectivity some of them weren't able to sort of connect and access the the training because you know it's either data challenges or regional access you know and really it calls for the big players in, in information technology you know for us to really work together and say you know how could these things be zero rated you know what other infrastructure development can can happen so it's really sobering and you definitely require that you know support in person support you can't just think this thing mm, yeah. by itself will will happen and that means the very same underserved communities and you know disenfranchised communities and then the divide grows like yeah. nangamso was saying that you know it, the, the gulf is becoming bigger and bigger so what are the simple things that we can really support so you need a, a support 
person to be able to guide the team, even go to the regions and maybe spend a few days with them and see how is it happening without, in fact, afterwards we even engaged the funder to say, have you, you know, the on the ground challenges are such, mm -hmm. you know, we promise that we'll be able to reach this target of ECD practitioners um, accessing and utilizing the, the training and then they're able to go. And then actually they, the funder themselves went there and really saw challenges. Mm -hmm that you know you want to merge whatever we're doing with a dose a huge one of reality and <laughs> realism and say in reality these are the challenges but how do we solve those just at a fundamental level got you marama whatsapp status <coughs> and morning prayers what is morning prayers are excellent oh, 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 so i was like oh, i cannot oh, wake up to almost <laughs> seven messages to WhatsApp. Wow. So that's yeah. also the very interesting yeah. you know, other yeah. side of it. Yeah. 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 Data constraints, yeah. infrastructure constraints, but WhatsApp yeah. status. Yeah. Yeah. Nama morning prayers. Oh yeah. my goodness. <laughs> Every day. Yeah. 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 Oh, so I, funny. I think for me, um, I'm we sorry. had to just uh, look at what a digital library looked like yeah. for us. Mm. And I think one is with everyone, the sobering uh, reality was who's, who are our beneficiaries, and our beneficiaries are the learners mm. before we start anyway. And because primarily we work with primary schools, mm. they don't have phones. Mm. They don't have phones, and then they don't have data, and the phones that they have access to are for the parents. Mm. And then I think uh, then we had to then bring back and say, how do we then work with the schools? Mm. But also the challenges mm. that we would be facing is the same challenges that the schools would be facing if we were to provide an online library mm. for a school and then we uh, bring all these um, books that were uh, freely available. Mm. Then how do the schools uh, then um, disseminate all this material? Yeah. So I think at the end of the day, what we decided was just to um, collaborate and to share material that the, was already out there uh, besides now as a bookery going out and creating our own online library because then we are not going to reach our target. So we had to say, okay, Nalibali has uh, free online material. Let's see if we can disseminate that. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, what we also then came up with was um, because uh, schools were closed for a long time, let's do Kasi libraries. What is that? It is having a, a library outside of the school, whether we, uh, we were at the, uh, outside the school gate or working with um, community centers mm -hmm. to say on this specific day, we're giving out libraries. Um, you, the learners or the children within these communities don't have to bring them back. Mm -hmm. So in that way, we were just increasing the number of books that are in the homes. And that was just a bookery initiative to say, this is what it looks like. But I think for us, like everyone else, Digital, it's not, I think it, it's important, but currently it's not a, it's a not priority. Perfect. Yeah. Do you know what I <coughs> Something that we find completely hilarious. I don't know if you've seen this video on social media. Um, it's men, Bachele Plant, yeah? uh, and one man stands there at here, um, a man and his daughter walking into the forest. Do you have you guys seen it? <laughs> And all these and they all stand up and they kind of like move away, right? Like, and and I keep thinking about it almost as the the idea of um, of of sometimes like how books are like really in our communities where it's like well right? Like, so just kind of thinking about this, like when you're saying now Kasi libraries, right? Like, I guess part of that is like thinking about innovative ways of making the library a place that it's not like well is what in Lendo out, you know? Like it's like, but it's actually a part of the community itself. But uh, that was just a, a quick uh, uh, <laughs> quick ad break. Well <laughs> I'm interested, what are some of the most innovative ways or like openings in your own, the own vistas of your own mind where you're beginning to say, you know, if we maybe thought about literacy in this way, there's something else we could be able to tap into. What, what is that for you? Like what's coming alive? Oh, uh, goodness, it, it's quite a lot. But I, I, I was thinking as well, they, a lot of people, they download a lot of apps in their phones so that they can have easy access and understanding of things. Mm -hmm. And also there's been a lot of parents' apps that have been de developed to help parents to understand, especially health and nutrition and all those, to, to give tips and everything. And literacy has been lacking behind. And, and it's not in those platforms. It, it's one of those key 
blind spots that we can just easily tap into and get into those already existing structures to say, actually, literacy is part of what parents should be driving, and these are the tips and guidelines that you can use. So already in the existing devices and the, in the existing structure, you don't have to reinvent the wheel and start something afresh. And what has been interesting is that if we make partnerships with corporates, especially banks, mm -hmm. to say your clients can download this and use it so that children can have access to books. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a physical book, you can have a digital book. Mm -hmm. And as they mentioned, is there are a number of zero-rated sites yeah. that parents can download those books. Got and you. Yeah. Got you. I've just got one more other thing. Oh, I don't know. We turned it. Yeah. Um, I've, I've always, like, if I were to look back, let's say, one day when I'm not on this earth, I look back and I'm like, judgment day comes and, like, I'm being asked serious questions. Um, one, I could... Yeah, what did you... <laughs> when I, what did you do? What was your contribution? Um, and for me, like, if I was given, like, a... Lim like, a... No budget constraints, no like, here's, go and dream, Nangam. So go and dream of like, what would this look like? You know, I often reflect, and I, so what I would like to see for literacy, you know, like, as clinic when a, when a child gets born, we are told, okay, it's like next month. And then I said, you could stand to eat the book and whatever the case is. It almost feels like, and uh, a, wow, a, a like similar that. thing of for literacy to say, okay, I have to go to a clinic because then I'm going to be six months. Yeah. When I go to the clinic, I get my jab, I get my sign, and oh yes, by the way, Mzali, that's a package yako for umdanako to read, to to engage, to or whatever. For the library there. Because they do it, they have to go anyway. That's that is one thing that I think we can all agree of, regardless of your social economic status. Yeah. That is that is the one thing that we all religiously do, yeah. and it almost feels like. Can we not create a system either embedded into the health system or like some sort of thing that like mm. by default so we talk about I mean Umamagas always talks about like changing behavior mm. but almost like how do we how do we leverage on this into a bazaar by enza yoka kata kata for the bandwa na babu he joined us he liked it but he's the only land then what the app then don't know all of those things um yeah so that's what I would I would yeah, if the budget was not a, yeah, um, smoking. That's, that's really that's smoking. <laughs> budget. Smoking. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, you're the only funder or intermediate, so I will constantly pick on you. <laughs> yes, and, 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 and I think maybe not for today, but yes. the funding, the funding conversation is one I think we need to seriously have as civil society organizations, I think. What are the low-hanging fruits for us to maximize in developing and enriching literacy learning spaces in this country? And in Africa and beyond, actually. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? Um, I think learning and schooling are like separate sides of the same coin, right? And I think we have to firstly accept that learning happens outside of schooling as well, right? And that enriches schooling. So I think the low hanging fruit is in creating learning spaces outside of the school obviously. Secondly, just to the tech question, I think when we think tech, we always think high tech. We think um, tablets with certain software, but I think we, we less often think low tech, like phone calls, like you spoke about WhatsApp um, you, during the pandemic and all of that. So I think both of those things have to be done. We have to start somewhere. Um, and I think also thirdly, there was a time in this country and in the world where we did didn't think that people would have cell phones as they do today. So, you know, with cell phone penetration at the levels that it is now, I think it can only get better and better and increase, right? So I do think we have to put tools in the hands of children. They already have some cell phones. I hear what you're saying about uh, primary school and the lack of cell phones, but I think it's about access to a cell phone in the home, in the community, right? Um, but I do think that we have to push 
public, I mean private companies to provide these things. I think your RAINs, your MTNs, your Vodacoms have to make it possible for every school to not only have a library, but have computers in the library, to have tablets in that library. All of us, all of our organizations need tablet banks. We have access, we need access to tools that kids can use to learn, right? So I think these things have to be done. We can't sit back and say, oh, not enough people have cell phones. Uh, there isn't enough data. Not all spaces have Wi-Fi. Uh, we have to push government to do it, but also push private companies to provide it.